Good evening, everyone. So tonight, I'd like to tell you about magic. I'd like you to imagine the following scenario. Imagine you find yourself on some kind of adventure, and you're clambering through a cold, dark, damp cavern. And to light your way, you take from your pocket a crystal. And through some method of incantation, you cause the crystal to light up the moss-covered rocks around you. OK? So in that scenario, it seems safe to assume that you, whoever you may be, are a wizard, and that magic is at work. Does that sound kind of reasonable to everyone? In that scenario? OK, good. Because here's the thing. We perform this spell every single day. In fact, we're performing it right now, because the lights that are lighting this theater are LEDs, light-emitting diodes. And those are nothing but crystals. And the spell we cast to cause them to light up is simply passing electric current through them. And we do this at a flick of a switch. So you might feel cheated now. You might think, OK, so causing a crystal to light up isn't magical after all, because it's just like turning on a light switch. If there's anything I can convince you of tonight, I hope it's the opposite, that you were right to think in that fantasy setting that um, by you were causing, uh, sorry, magic was at work when you were causing a crystal to light up. You were right to think that was magic. But then you must also admit that it's magical when you turn on a light switch and cause a crystal to light up in that way. That's what I'm going to try and convince you of tonight. OK, so uh, let me grab my clicker. Here we go. Um, so the modern name for magic, as I think we all know, is physics. And the modern name for the magic work by a wizard is condensed matter physics. <laughs> so can I see a show of hands? Who's heard of condensed matter physics? Quite a few people. That's good. That's good. But probably less than half the audience, I'd say. Um, so you're a very, uh, very uh, scientific literature, li literate audience, I think. Uh, but generally, people haven't heard of this. Um, so it's, what is it? Let me tell you that to start with. So condensed matter physics is the study of matter, the different states of matter, and the transformations between them, and also how they come about through the interactions between atoms and molecules uh, in the world of quantum mechanics of the very small. So why is it that people don't tend to have heard of this? Uh, remarkably, it's actually the biggest area in all of physics. So about a third of all physicists identify as condensed matter physicists. But maybe 50% of the people in the room have heard of it. But who, for example, has heard of, uh, say, gravitational waves? Everyone, I think, right? OK, so why is it that we haven't, we've heard of gravitational waves but not condensed matter physics? Um, and I, the, I think there's essentially two reasons for this. The first is that it's the study of matter, and matter is familiar. I mean, our entire existence is states of matter, right? Uh, and it's a bit harder to see the magic in the familiar. The other reason is that it's inherently practical. Now, all of physics is ultimately practical. When we study things such as gravitational waves, the technology we use to study those phenomena uh, ends up filtering down to everyday applications. But condensed matter physics has applications on a much shorter time scale. So for example, these lights um, may not have been LEDs sort of 10 to 15 years ago. Typically, you would have had an incandescent bulb that might have been like a 100-watt bulb in your house, say. And that job is now done by a 2-watt LED. So that's a 50 times energy saving. It's hugely important, but being practical and familiar seems to be at odds with that sense of magic you can have with things such as gravitational waves, where I don't have to tell you why they're magical. It's just apparent. So I'm going to try to convince you tonight that the practical and the familiar can be magical. It's just of a more subtle form. In fact, I think it's precisely the magic worked by a wizard. So if you think of your favorite wizards, broadly interpreted, it might be Harry and Hermione in Hogwarts. It could be uh, Morgan Le Fay or, or Merlin, an Arthurian legend. Or it could be some supernaturally talented scientist like Doctor Who or someone like that. OK, what do they do? They don't do magic on the scale of the entire universe. And they don't rewrite the rules of reality. They do bits of practical, hands-on magic that helps their friends around them in the story. Does that sound kind of reasonable? In fact, I read The Hobbit for the first time recently. I'm ashamed to admit that I hadn't read it before. Uh, and I saw that basically the only magic that Gandalf performs in The Hobbit is lighting up a crystal. So it's a, a bit of practical magic for his friends. OK, so in this talk, I'm going to introduce condensed matter physics. 
Uh, and I'm going to focus on a familiar state of matter, but one that nevertheless is quite magical, and that is crystals. And then towards the end of the talk, I'm going to focus on, instead on a, a less familiar state of matter. And being less familiar, I think its magic is perhaps easier to see. But then we're going to return to look at the familiar, hopefully with new eyes, and see that the familiar can be magical after all. Okay, so I'm going to start by introducing... Uh, well, let, let me tell you what condensed matter physics is first. So I've said it's, it's the, states, study, the study of the states of matter, the transformations between them, and how they come about from the quantum world. The name condensed matter physics is a little bit opaque, I think. What, we understand what matter is, but what is, what's condensed about it? Well, if we think of condensation, we would typically think of water appearing on a window pane. And that's good intuition to have. So what's happening there is that water is changing state from uh, its gaseous form, water vapor, to its liquid form. And what's happening on the microscopic scale of atoms and molecules is that the water molecules are inter interacting together so that they stick together, and, and that's how they've changed state. You can no longer think of them as molecules flying around independently. They've stuck together and become something familiar that we can just see and touch. So if condensed matter physics had a tagline, I think it would be this. I think it would be that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And that's kind of what you're thinking about when you think of water appearing on a window pane. Because before that happens, we can roughly think of the water molecules as flying around independently. But after they've condensed, they form this state of matter, uh, liquid, and we can no longer think of them as independent. So in condensed matter physics, we take that idea of condensation uh, and apply it more broadly. So you can imagine taking the water and cooling it down further, and we could think of it as condensing further, freezing into a solid. And then you really can't think of those as individual molecules. Does that sound kind of reasonable to everyone? Okay, good. All right, so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. And I'm going to focus first on what I think is the most wizardly state of matter, and that is crystals, which uh, what, what wizard worth her sage wouldn't have a pocket full of crystals at any one time? I hopefully you agree with me it's the most wizardly state of matter. We'll, we'll see at the end. So uh, if we could switch over to the camera quickly. Thank you, Max. So... Uh, I'm going to show you three different crystals, and I'm going to ask you what, what they are. Okay, so we'll see, let me see a show of hands who can identify these crystals. So here's the first one. Uh, let's try and get it in focus there. So can anyone identify this crystal here? It's not diamond. Uh, yes, it's quartz. It's quartz. That's exactly right. Uh, who said quartz? I had a shout. Yeah? Anyway, so what was your name, sir? <laughs> David, can we have a round of applause for David, please? It's quartz. Uh, very good. So quartz is, I think, the classic crystal. Right? When we think of a crystal, we think of something that looks like quartz, probably. And what is it that we're thinking of? I think the thing that's kind of striking about crystals is that they have these beautifully flat faces, they have very sharp edges and vertices, and they have these very well-defined angles. So if we look... If we find an angle like this, this angle will be 120 degrees, you see on the top here. Whoops, there we go. And it's not close to 120 degrees, it's exactly 120 degrees. And we find another angle, it'll, it'll be similarly well defined, so maybe this one up here on the top. So I find this really remarkable, because quartz like this can just come out of the ground looking just like that. So no one's had to work it to look like this. The way I think of it is that crystals are the spell that casts itself. No wizard has to create this thing. It just comes out of the ground with these beautiful geometrical forms. But how does it do that? Because, I mean, the ground is, is literally dirt, right? It's disordered. It's chaotic. So why is this thing coming out of it that's, that's completely ordered like this? We'll see how this happens shortly. So crystals such as quartz are, I think, inherently magical. You can kind of see the magic to them. But it's also a practical magic. Uh, so if you... Um, one of the practical... Uh, effects that quartz shows. They all have their magical powers, crystals, but one of the practical ones that quartz shows is that if you squeeze quartz, you generate an electrical voltage. So this is a phenomenon called piezoelectricity. You may recall that a voltage is, um, if you think of an electrical current as like the flow of a river, a voltage is like a hill in a landscape that causes the river to flow. Okay, so squeezing a quartz crystal can cause the flow of electrical current. So, that's hugely important, in fact. It's something like a $20 billion a year industry, piezoelectricity. Um, one of the places you may have seen it is in a lighter. If you've ever taken a lighter and turned it on, you'll have noticed that the thing that causes the flame to, uh, to ignite is that there's a little spark in there. 
And if you've ever taken a lighter apart, you'll find that inside, the thing that causes the spark looks like this. I'm going to try and show you the spark. It's a little bit hard to capture on the camera. Uh, could we have the lights down, please, Max? So let's try and get this here. We'll give it a go and see if it works. So I'll do it on three, so you're looking for the spark. It's going to jump from, from the end of the wire up to my thumb, probably. So three, two, one. I don't know how we didn't see it there. <laughs> let's try this again. Here we go. Three, two, let's get a little bit closer. Three, two, one. There we go. Did you see that? Phew. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have a round of applause for that. Thank you. They say you never work with children, animals, or piezoelectric crystals. I think I heard that somewhere. Um, okay, so how does this work? Is there a battery in here? There's not. In fact, all that's happening here is I'm pressing uh, this... Sorry, let me just the microphone slide. I'm pressing the button down here, and it's squeezing a quartz crystal that's hidden inside. So that spark is coming about purely from me pressing a quartz crystal. So this is already a practical technology. It's got some uses that are still in development. So scientists are developing um, a device so that when you walk around in public spaces, we can have piezoelectric devices under the floor. So when you walk around, you squash the floor slightly. And we can use that to generate an electric current that could be used to charge up, for example, your phones as you walk around. So it's also got some practical uh, technology that hasn't quite come about yet. People are developing that. Okay, so that one's quartz. Let's try the second crystal now. So I think they get a little bit harder as we go along. So let, let's have hands up. Can anyone identify this crystal here? It's, uh, yeah, it is Kelsa. Yes, I, I heard a few guesses. <laughs> All right, round of applause. It, that's Kelsa. Very good. So calcite shows, it's got these beautiful forms again, uh, comes out of the ground just like this, and it shows what I think is one of my favorite bits of magic. So if I get this conveniently placed book here <laughs> and put it right in the center of the shot, there is a point to this. Um, you take the calcite and you place it over the letters. You see two copies of the words. Do you see that? And when you rotate it, one of those copies should rotate around the other one. See the eye turning around the other one? Look at that. Isn't that cool? So this is called birefringence, or sometimes double refraction. And it's, it's a practical um, technology, once again. We use it in LCD TVs. They use birefringence to operate. Um, but this particular magical power of a crystal led us to some rather profound insights about the nature of reality. So I said that condensed matter physicists don't just study the states of matter. They try to understand how they come about from interactions in the microscopic world of quantum mechanics. And you may have heard that this is a rather paradoxical world and an unfamiliar one. So one of the, um, the, the most strange things about quantum mechanics was realized from looking through birefringent crystals like quartz, oh, sorry, like calcite. Uh, because we see these two copies of the words. So at the level of thinking of light as a beam, that seems pretty reasonable. The beam goes in, splits into two. Maybe it's like a river forking. But what happens when we try to describe the world on the smallest scales, when we say, what's the beam of light made up of itself? So the answer to that question was given to us by Albert Einstein, who said that we can think of light as being carried by individual particles of light called photons. So we already run into some difficulty when we think about calcite in terms of these photons, because when it's light, it just splits into two. But imagine doing this with a single photon. So I send a photon of light in like this, and it goes this way, say. Now I set up an identical experiment. I send an identical photon in, and this time it goes down instead of up. But that seems to violate the basic premise of science, right? Because if you set up an identical uh, experiment, you expect to get the same outcome. That's induction. That's the, the basic idea of science. Things should be deterministic like that. But we can see already that on the smallest scale, if we try to describe this as individual particles, there has to be only a probability for it to go one way and a probability for it to go the other way. In fact, we can't do any better than that. We can't say for certain what it's going to do. We can only give probabilities. So if you think about it, that's quite a, a strange thing to have realized. This, this point was made very clearly by one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Paul Dirac, in his uh, 1931 textbook. He says, just consider birefringent crystals, and you can already see that uh, you're going to run into some difficulties when you think about things on the smaller scales. Okay, so we'll return to that point shortly. 
First, let me show you the third and final crystal. I think this one's getting a bit tricky now. So I'm going to give up on asking for hands. Just shout out if you think you know what it is. So uh, here it is. Any guesses? I think I heard it. Did someone shout it a bit louder? Bismuth, exactly. That's exactly right. That's a very tricky one. So I think we'll give a big round of applause for the bismuth. That's the answer. So again, it comes out of the ground just like this. You see it's got these beautiful sort of Mayan pyramid shapes to it. In fact, this one didn't come out of the ground. My friend Tom Brooks grew this for me. Uh, he's a very accomplished woodsman. I went to see him very recently, and he had to send us coordinates for where he lives rather than an address. Um, that's absolutely true. And uh, he, so he made a fire, uh, and he put a pan over the fire, and he melted down an ingot of bismuth um, into a liquid. And then he used some pliers to start pulling it out, and as you pull it out, it just crystallizes just like this. So one of the remarkable things about bismuth is that not only is it a crystal, it's also, it's also a metal. So that might sound kind of contradictory. I think when we think of crystals, we tend to think of things like quartz. Um, but actually, basically every metal is also a crystal. <coughs> Can we switch back to the slides, please, Max? Um, so what is it that makes all these three things crystals? They all seem totally different. They have these different magical powers. What is it that unites them? To answer that question, we need to travel again down to the smaller scales. And we find that all crystals, uh, when we, on the smaller scales, have a regular periodic array of atoms. So periodic as in evenly spaced. So we can imagine, take, so these are the atoms here. They're kind of a crude drawing. I've drawn the atoms as spheres. And you can imagine taking that sphere and putting it into a cube-shaped box. And then we can take those cube-shaped boxes, many copies of them, and stack them together perfectly without any gaps or defects. And you see then they all have this regular periodic structure. So um, rather than just show you my, my fairly rubbish drawing of, of what it might look like on the atomic scale, I thought I'd give you a bit of a hands-on demonstration. So I'm being uh, given a quick hand here by Mike. So what I have here is um, it's a cube made of mirrors, and the mirrors are half-silvered. So they let some light through, uh, but not all of it. And inside, there's a ping-pong ball which can light up. So I thought this might be an, a, a way to think about what's happening on the atomic scale inside a crystal, uh, but I can't make it because I'm a theoretical physicist and therefore incapable of doing anything practical. So I asked my friend Emma Powell to make this. She, Emma founded a company called Air Giants, where they make giant um, air-powered robots. Uh, and her and the Air Giants team have built this for us. We've taken to calling it the Infinity Cube. So let's turn it on. So there's only one ping-pong ball in here, but you're seeing many mirror images of it. So in that direction, it sort of bends off, but let's look down here. So you're seeing many copies of the ping pong ball like that. And if we look down, certain, if we look down a diagonal, we see hexagons, in fact. Can you see that? And then maybe look down an edge, and we'll see some nice planes of atoms like this. Let's try and get it like that. Off they go. So this is what you might see if you lived in the world of atoms inside a crystal. So each of those ping pong balls is supposed to be a different atom. There we go. Thanks very much. Let's put that down on the desk again. I think we should give a round of applause for Emma and the uh, team at Air Giants. OK, so this uh, regular periodic array of the atoms answers that question. How is it that crystals are this spell that casts itself? Well, you can see that So to build a crystal, let's take calcite as an example. In this case, the boxes aren't the shape of cubes. In fact, in this case, the boxes that hold the atoms it may not be a single atom, maybe a few atoms. Each of those boxes is identical, and in this case, they're the shape of the crystal itself, something like this. So with crystals, it's kind of like that magical maxim, as above, so below, because you build a crystal that's this shape because you have boxes that are the same shape on the atomic scale. And you can see how they come about because, um, say, let's look at the picture of the atoms again. Uh, pick one of those atoms, say it wants neighbors through the faces of a cube. Of course, the cubes don't really exist. They're just a convenient way to think of it. Really, it's the interactions between the atoms that hold them in that structure. But whatever one of those atoms wants, all the others want the same environment, because they're the same type of atom. So the first one wants neighbors through the faces of a cube. The next one wants the same thing, and so on. And you see that the easiest way to do this is to build, a, build up a regular periodic structure. And so when we get these beautiful flat faces of our crystal, that's really atomically flat in many cases. You're seeing the sort of surface of those boxes. So that's how that works. Um, I'm, before I carry on, I'm going to show you what I think is the crystal's most magical power. Um, 
I should warn you, though, that I've shown you uh, piezoelectricity, I've shown you birefringence, but I think, have you ever noticed when, uh, when a wizard is learning spells for the first time, right? a young wizard comes to study at the wizardry school, they always want to um, learn the fanciest spells, right? And the old teachers, they never want to teach the fancy spells, they want to do the basics again and again. You've noticed this when, when, with wizards training? Or, you know, it doesn't have to be wizards, it can be any, any art, I think, has this, this property. So I think the most profound thing that all crystals do is the following. Um, I'm just going to show it to you here. So I take the crystal, and I take my finger, and I push this end of the crystal, and the other end moves. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I think that's quite exciting. I'm going to try and convince you it is exciting later on. But if you think about it, it's not that obvious, because if you took a liquid, you wouldn't expect it to do that. You take a liquid and you stick your finger in it, and the whole liquid doesn't move. Your finger goes into the liquid, right? So what's happened here, this is the matter has condensed again. The crystal, when I push an atom over here, all of the atoms resist the push. So when I put my finger into a liquid, it's quite easy to do. I'm pushing against individual water molecules, if it's water, say. Um, if it freezes into ice, I try to push one molecule, and all of them resist. So this is this condensed matter. It's the whole is now more than the sum of the parts. OK, well, we'll return to that, that magic trick later. Um, so living down on this atomic scale, inside the, uh, the infinity cube here, let's take a look at it. Um, the world is a bit of a, a less familiar world to the one that, uh, that we live in. I think this gets down to the heart of why condensed matter physicists are so excited about their subject. Um, to understand why, let's take a step back and think, what is it that we do as physicists in general? And I think one way to think about what a physicist does is they try to spot hidden connections that underlie reality. So we try to look at seemingly different phenomena and understand that they're connected by deep roots. And we, for example, discover laws of the universe. Say, the speed of light is constant, and it's the fastest speed there is. That's one of the laws that, that we probably all know. Now, we can uh, discover these laws, but we can't dictate what they are. We can't choose to live in a universe that has a different speed of light, for example. We're fixed, stuck in one universe. So this is why condensed matter physics is so exciting. It was put most clearly to me by a friend of mine, Steve Blandell, who's a professor of condensed matter physics at Oxford University. And he said, in, in the universe as a whole, we're, we're stuck with our laws of physics and we discover them. But in condensed matter physics, we get to choose what the laws are. Because if you think about it, the speed of light, let's take a, a simple example, the speed of light is constant and the fastest speed. But that's only true in the vacuum. When light enters a material, it slows down. This is the phenomenon of refraction. So inside materials, the speed of light is different. But if we think about living inside a crystal such as calcite, for example, the world is a weirder place still, because in calcite, there's not one speed of light, but two. And the speed of light depends on which direction you're looking in. So you might try and imagine living in that world, living inside this infinity cube, living on this scale of atoms inside calcite. So say you're looking off at the stars in calcite, you would see two copies of every star. And if something happens to one of the stars, say it goes supernova, um, the two images of the supernova would, would appear at different times. And the delay between those two images would depend on which direction you're looking in. So it's quite an unfamiliar and strange world inside crystals. And as Steve put it to me, when we discover the laws of physics, uh, we're limited by what those laws are. But in condensed matter physics, we're really only limited by our own imaginations because we can dream up new laws of physics. And if we know a skilled enough crystal grower, we can go and find those laws realized somewhere. So a very clear example of this is what I think is probably the most the unique thing that condensed matter physicists study that isn't studied in other subjects. So there's lots of overlaps with other subjects, for example, with chemistry or um, with engineering at the more applied side or the more theoretical end that I work at, uh, there's overlaps with philosophy. So what's unique to condensed matter physics? And one thing I can think of is, um, uh, well, I think probably the only thing, maybe, that's unique to condensed matter physics is the study of what are called quasi-particles. So it sounds quite, um, it sounds quite uh, uh, perplexing, but it's not too strange an idea. So what's a particle, first of all? A particle is something like a particle of light we heard of before, the photon, or an electron. I think a good definition of a particle is something that can exist by itself in the vacuum of space and cannot be reduced to other things with that property. 
Okay, so electrons and photons have that property. An atom can exist by itself in space, but it can be reduced to protons, neutrons, and electrons. So we wouldn't call that a particle. Let's take it as a working definition. So take the electron, for example. It's traveling through space. All electrons have the same mass, and they have the same charge. And if a particle has these properties, then it is an electron. What happens when that electron enters a material? Say it enters a bismuth crystal, for example. Well, it interacts with all the electrons and the atoms and so on inside the crystal. And after all these interactions are taken into account, and we can do this using quantum mechanics, we, we calculate all the effects of this, the end result, remarkably, looks pretty much like an electron again. But it's got a different mass and it's got a different charge. And so therefore, it isn't an electron. It's something else. It's a whole that's more than the sum of the parts. We call it a quasi-electron. It's a bit like an electron, but a bit different. So I have a demonstration that gives some insight about this, hopefully. So what I have over here is a set of compasses. Let me just get my magic wands out of the way. Um, <laughs> so I've got a set of compasses here. And let's say this magnet here, we can imagine this is the electron. It's traveling through space like this. Now it's going to enter the material. Well, what it does is it interacts with all, all the stuff in that material. And as you might imagine, it starts pulling these compasses by analogy. Okay? But by Newton's third law, it's not just that this pulls the compasses. The compasses also pull back on the magnet with an equal and opposite force. So if I move the magnet around over here, it requires a certain amount of effort. If I try to do the same thing over here, it requires slightly more effort because I'm now pulling against all those magnetic fields. And so from Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration. It's requiring more force to cause the same acceleration, and therefore you can think of the magnet's mass as, as having increased. Really, it's a magnet in all these interactions. So that's the idea of a quasi-particle. Through those interactions, it can become something slightly different. Now, um, so the electron and the quasi-electron are one, one decent example of this. I think probably the most... Um, Profound cases of these quasi-particles are things that literally can't exist outside of materials. So, um, when we take this, this, this magnet in this analogy, it turns into a, this kind of quasi-magnet, but, okay. but you think, okay, well, it's really just the magnet pulling against those things. We can have particles where there just isn't a, a version of it living outside the crystal. So it's like I've got a fake magnet like this. I don't have one at all. Let me just use my magic wand quickly. Just make a, a fake magnet like this. I'm going to move it over here, and it's going to cause the effect as if it were there. What do you think? That's, that's my, that's, I'm going to try two magic tricks tonight, and that's one of them. I, I, I'm going to tell you how I did it, because I consulted two magicians before I gave this talk, and they said, don't try and do magic tricks. Uh, you'll be rubbish at them, they said, and everyone will forget the science. They'll only remember the magic tricks and want to know how they worked. So uh, I cheated. I stuck a magnet to my hand, as you probably <laughs> guessed. But the analogy works, I think, because there are particles that can exist where the particle itself doesn't exist outside the material. And a classic example of this, which is quite well represented by that magic trick, is the example of a particle of sound. So we know particles of light can exist, photons. Particles of sound can't exist because sound can't travel through a vacuum. It just can't exist in space. Sound needs a medium to travel through. But when sound does travel through a medium, when it travels through a crystal, for example, if you take a crystal and you speak some magic words to it, you're, you're creating vibrations in the crystal. And that process, when we describe it on the smaller scales, we can describe it as being carried by particles. And we call those particles phonons rather than photons. So it's very much like this uh, analogy with the compasses, because there's not really anything there. You can think of it really just as the vibrations of the atoms. But it's a perfectly valid description to say it's being carried by particles. In fact, mathematically identical to how you describe particles uh, in other scenarios. So you can sort of tell where the phonon is, uh, even though it wasn't actually there. It was a trick. So for a long time, um, this, this story of, of atoms down on the smaller scale uh, would have just been something I'd have to tell you. You'd have to just have to believe me. I think we probably all believe the world is made of atoms. Um, but you wouldn't expect to be able to see individual atoms, right? That's something that's probably forever forbidden to us. Maybe we'll switch back to the slides quickly, because it turns out remarkably that these days condensed matter physicists have found means of taking pictures of individual atoms. So you don't just have to take my word for it anymore. So one of the techniques used to do this is called scanning tunneling microscopy. And here's an image of some individual atoms on a crystal taken by Professor Vidya Madhaven uh, and her PhD student, Dr. Jorge Olivares Rodriguez, sorry, he's a, he's a postdoc now. 
Um, and uh, they're at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So Professor Madhaven is one of the world experts using scanning tunneling microscopes. And here's a picture of strontium atoms on the surface of a crystal. And you can see that they're pretty much, as I described, right? they're kind of like fuzzy balls, which is my, what you might have imagined when you saw atoms. Okay? Some of the fuzziness, by the way, is because of this inherently probabilistic nature of the quantum world. Okay, so in this story, I told you about the compasses, and, and the, the story of quasi-particles probably makes some intuitive sense, but maybe it doesn't seem that magical. It's just like the magnet pulling against the compasses. But that's an inherently classical story I'm telling you there, and really, the world of atoms is quantum mechanical. So one other thing you may have heard about quantum mechanics is that you can't really think of things as either particles or as waves. They're really quantum objects that sometimes have properties of one and sometimes of the other. So when they're behaving kind of particle-like, you might get fuzzy balls. But in other circumstances, here's another picture of the surface of a crystal, taken by Professor Seamus Davis's group in Oxford University College Cork and Cornell. Here you see that they're behaving, the electrons in this material are behaving a lot more like waves. Right? Doesn't it just look like raindrops landing on a pond? Uh, so where it's white there, that's a high probability to find an electron. And you really see they're rippling out. Like, like waves on a pond. So in that case, they're behaving a lot more like waves. And from this point of view, this idea of quasi-particles is really quite bizarre. Because a better analogy, might, in this case, might be something like imagining a drop of ink falling through the air. It looks kind of particle-like, maybe. But it lands in some water, and what happens, it spreads out. It interacts with the water molecules, and that just causes the ink to spread out. The thing doesn't look like a drop of ink anymore, right? It just looks like a, a bit of a mess. But in condensed matter physics, this, this drop-like quantum object, this electron, say, lands in the material, in the bismuth, and it, it interacts, and you'd imagine it would spread out like the ink. But somehow, remarkably, the end result looks almost the same as a drop falling through the material. But its properties have changed. So I, I, I think this is really getting to the, the heart of what's kind of magical about condensed matter physics and why, why condensed matter physicists find it so exciting. OK, so I've told you a little bit about crystals and they're somewhat familiar. I'd now, at this point, like to tell you uh, about a different state of matter, and one that's rather less familiar. So uh, we're going to have wheeled on in a second um, uh, a, a magic trick. I'm not going to tell you what the state of matter is. I'm just going to show you its magic. I'm going to ask you what the state of matter is. Sound good? <laughs> OK, so before I do, it's worth bearing in mind that there are more than three states of matter. We're often told there's solids, liquids, and gases. Sometimes we're told there's plasmas, the fourth state of matter, as it's sometimes called, ionized gases. But actually, there are many different states of matter. Um, there are liquid crystals, somewhere between liquids and solids. There are also much more familiar things that are beyond those states of matter. For example, if I can take it apart, uh, magnets. So you take a magnet, and you heat it up, and above a certain temperature, called its Curie temperature, it stops being magnetic. You cool it down again, and uh, it spontaneously becomes magnetic at that temperature. And it's really similar to water condensing, changing state. So magnets you can think of as their own state of matter. So I'm going to demonstrate a, a magical effect here, um, which has been set up for us by, by Mike here, who's now going to film it. Can I sneak in behind the, uh, the, the magical apparatus? So um, I'm going to ask you what state of matter it is, and we're, we're going to... See if we can work it out. So I've got a few red herrings here. I have a magical crystal here. I have a magic wand here. This is made of sycamore, of course, which J.K. Rowling tells us is the, uh, the one substance for the curious. Some of this may be red herrings. Uh, and I'm going to whisper some magic words to this. You can see it's really ready to start doing its magic. Let's try this. And with a bit of magic, it should be levitating. You can give it a little spin. You can see it going. Have I, uh, I was like, well, let's just give it a little poke, and it's quite happy sitting there. It doesn't really want to move very far. You can try and turn it, and it's still stuck there. And in fact, we've got this nice sheet under it, so I can pull this, and you can see it's really quite happily sat there. Look at that. There we go. So, any guesses as to what state of matter has caused this magic here? It's a superconductor. That's exactly right. Let's have a round of applause for the superconductor and for the correct identification. So as you may have guessed, some of this red herringness was to conceal the liquid nitrogen hidden beneath. So there's a magnet here. Let me, um, do I have some, I do have some scissors hidden, hidden here under the magical apparatus. Oh dear. 
Whoosh. <laughs> there were some scissors. Um, right, there we go. We wanted to take the tape off, but it's really uh, it's being very magical today. Never work with children, animals, piazza electric devices, or superconductors. Look at that. Okay. So, it's a superconductor. Very well done. Um, and it's showing here a very magical phenomenon called the Meissner effect. So you can see it's levitating above the superconductor. It's a rather unfamiliar thing. We don't expect things to do that every day. Um, let me... Uh, we're enjoying looking at that. I might switch to the slides again, if that's all right. Uh, tear us away from the superconductor. Uh, could we have the slides up, please? Uh, I think it's probably, it looks like it's in there for the long run, doesn't it? Thanks very much. Can we have a round of applause for Mike for being the uh, excellent magical assistant? Thank you. Yeah, it looks like it's going to stay there. Thank you. So uh, it's showing the Meissner effect. And this is a phenomenon unique to superconductors, uh, which is that superconductors perfectly expel magnetic fields. So all familiar matter allows magnetic fields to penetrate it to some extent. Superconductors banish it. It has a spell of banishment on magnetic fields. So if we take... Uh, have we got the slides up? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we take a magnet. I've drawn the lines of magnetic flux around this. Remember, if you sprinkle iron filings around a magnet, they, they follow these lines. In fact, this was uh, first understood by Michael Faraday right here in the Royal Institution downstairs, uh, where his labs are located. So here are the lines of magnetic flux coming from the magnet, how we understand the magnetic field. And we take this material that's going to become a superconductor, but it hasn't done it yet. So it, when it's at room temperature, this material here, the one underneath, is a ceramic a little bit like porcelain or something. Um, when we cool it down, it has to change state, and become this new state of matter, the superconductor. The change of state, so if it were a liquid turning into... Uh, uh, sorry, if it were water turning into ice, we'd call it freezing. Uh, in this case, the change of state is undergone by the electrons in the material, and we say that they undergo both einstein condensation. And the result is that the electrons are formed up into this new state of matter called a bose einstein condensate. So... When it does this, it perfectly banishes the magnetic field. And you can see already that this could maybe levitate a magnet above the superconductor, because it's, and then that's, of course, a magnet on top there. Uh, and so that's forcing the, the flux lines out of the way. It's creating a force that could levitate it. In fact, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, this is what's called a type 2 superconductor, which means it lets magnetic flux through in fixed amounts. So this sounds like a bit of a cop-out. It doesn't actually... It, it passes through what was the ceramic, but it never passes into the condensate. That can never let magnetic fields in. The way to understand this is to think of, think of a bathtub. We take the, the plug out, and we get a vortex swirling down. And you can see, right from the top of the water, there's a, a nice hole all the way through the water down into the plug. Right? There's a stable hole through the water. And that's what's happening here. The Bose-Einstein condensate that's, that uh, the electrons are formed into, they swirl around the lines of magnetic flux, and they actually pin it in place. So it's not just that the magnet is um, being pushed up, it's also being pinned in that place. And so you can see it's sort of rocking back and forth about that spot, but it doesn't want to move from there. It's very keen to get into it as well, I think you saw. So there, the, it's kind of an unfamiliar state of matter because it only exists at very low temperatures. That's why the liquid nitrogen had to be there. And that was the cause for some of our subterfuge, covering it up. Uh, but they're an inherently practical state of matter as well. So every MRI scanner in any hospital that has one, a magnetic resonance imaging scanner, they all use superconductors to do that. Uh, they're used for magnetic levitation. Uh, the fastest train in the world is uh, in Japan, and it uses superconductors to levitate the train above the tracks so that you lose all the friction with the track and it can go extremely fast. The only thing that's left is the air resistance. Um, and uh, they're used, for example, to uh, accelerate particles at, in CERN to nearly the speed of light. We use superconductors for all these different things. The reason I wanted to highlight it is I think its main applications lie in the very near future. And to motivate that, I'd like to ask you a rhetorical question. Why is it that we don't just cover the Sahara in solar panels? It's probably all, we've probably all wondered this at some point. Well, there are geopolitical reasons and there are environmental reasons. It's not just empty space. Uh, it's a valuable ecosystem. But are there physical reasons we don't cover the Sahara and solar panels and send the electricity around the whole world and, and uh, to where we need it? And the answer is that there, there is a physical reason we don't do this. And that the reason is that when you send electricity down a power line, you necessarily lose some of it along the way. So 
Um, you may have noticed this if you've ever walked under a power line, you can just hear it buzzing, and of course that's a form of energy leaving the power line. The main form of loss of electricity from a power line is what's called corona discharge. So to get the current to flow down the line, you have to create this voltage, remember, like making a hill in the landscape to cause the river to flow. But by creating that voltage, you also create a voltage from the power line to the earth beneath it. And so you encourage the electricity to flow out of the power line and through the air. So one way to see this is if you have uh, a strip light like this and you walk under a power line, it'll literally just light up as the electricity travels through it and lights it up. You don't need wires or anything. Now, remarkably, I can demonstrate this to you. I don't have the power line to show you, but I do have a source of high voltage electricity, uh, which will be familiar to anybody who lived through the 90s. And that is this device here, usually called a plasma ball. Looks very 90s, doesn't it? Uh, so can we have the lights down a little bit? Thank you. So this plasma ball uh, it has a very high voltage from the central part to the outer glass. And you can see that's encouraging the electricity to flow from the central bit to the outer glass, and it's lighting up a gas on the way. The electricity doesn't just stop on the surface, though. It has to travel from there through the air and into the Earth. So, for example, if I provide a more convenient route to Earth, you can see it finding its way onto my finger, and then harmlessly it travels through me into the Earth instead. So the claim is, if I take this strip light and I point it at the plasma ball, it will light up without any wires or anything. So let's give it a go. There we go. Isn't that cool? The plasma ball was invented by Nikola Tesla, in fact. And, uh, um, so uh, he sees it's lighting it up. It's the electricity is traveling through the air, through the light, through my hand to the Earth. I can give it a more convenient route to Earth with my finger, like this. If I do, let me, so it should just follow where my finger's going, like that. And I can turn it on and off. A little bit like a lightsaber, isn't it? <laughs> in fact, I, all these demonstrations I'm showing you tonight, I basically came up with while messing around as a child. I had a plasma ball because it was at the start of the X-Files, and I found one of these in a skip. And I thought, what happens if I combine these two? And uh, it turned out it's a little bit like a lightsaber. It's one of the better things that could have come out of it. OK. Thanks very much. Can we have the lights back up? OK. So in that demonstration, it's fun, this, this corona discharge effect. But in power lines, it's a huge source of loss. In fact, uh, I calculated that in the United States, every single year, the amount of energy that's lost uh, in getting the electricity from where it's generated to the houses is enough to power every streetlight in Manhattan for a 1,000 years. That's how much energy is lost every year. And of course, a huge amount of money and investment has gone into trying to minimize these losses, but there are fundamental physical limits on how good we can get at it. But this is where superconductors come in, because if we had power lines made of superconductors, they would, as their name suggests, uh, conduct the electricity uh, extremely well. In fact, they conduct it perfectly. They do it without any resistance. And it's not just like very little resistance, it's, it's zero resistance. This has actually already been used, in fact. Um, there are certain places in the world where we're using superconducting power lines already. Um, Essen in Germany has a superconducting power line. They bury them underground rather than putting them overhead, so it helps with uh, the appearances as well. And in the United States, there's um, a plan underway to try and connect three different major power grids, the East and West Coasts and Texas, because then they can balance the load between the different places, so they peak demands at different times. So they, if they can connect them up, it can help with the adoption of renewable energy. Um, it turns out it's, it's more efficient to use cooled superconductors to, to connect the things up than it is to try and dissipate all the heat that would be generated from putting all that electricity through a small region um, where they're trying to connect them up. So this isn't uh, science fiction stuff exactly. It's, it's, we are starting to develop this technology. So how do superconductors perform this magic? Uh, uh, the answer that's often given by scientists is that they, they perform their magic by manifesting that paradoxical world of quantum mechanics on our everyday scales. And there's a lot of truth to that statement. So to understand why it is, imagine you have a ring of superconductor and you set a current flowing around the ring. Okay? Now, it conducts so well, you, you, you leave the current flowing, you go off and live your life, and you, you come back at the end of a long and well-lived life and you measure the current, and you'll find it's flowing exactly as it was when you set it going. N literally none will have, have dissipated. And we've been doing experiments for something like 30 years measuring this, and it's still going, with, without any uh, measurable loss. 
So to understand what this has to do with quantum mechanics and the world of very small things, we can return to one of the motivating factors of quantum mechanics, why we came up with it. Because it's a very magical subject, but it's important to remember that we didn't just invent quantum mechanics because we wanted the world to be more magical. The world is magical. Quantum mechanics is just its most simple explanation. So one of the motivating factors was to explain the stability of, the at of atoms. So in 1911 to 1913, a series of experiments were carried out called the... the um, uh, Rutherford experiments is how we refer to them in the UK. And these showed that the uh, atom, while overall charge neutral, has a positive nucleus, a negative charge around the outside. But that's a bit of a mystery, because why doesn't the negative charge fall into the positive charge, since opposites attract? Well, people thought maybe it's a bit like the moon going around the Earth. Uh, we can imagine the electron orbiting uh, the nucleus, something like this. Right? The, the moon doesn't crash into the Earth. It, it, it orbits stably. But that doesn't work for charges, because if you take a charge and you move it in a circle like this, it turns out that it radiates energy, and so it loses energy. And if that were true, if the electron were literally orbiting, it would have to crash into the nucleus again. So what is happening? Well, we can take a clue from calcite, because remember, seeing those two images of the words told us that in, on the quantum scale, we can't really say for certain um, the outcomes of experiments. And the way this manifests in the atom is that we can't really say that the electron has a position and it orbits, like the moon orbiting the Earth. Instead, we can only say there's a probability to find the electron in different places. And it turns out that this probability is evenly smeared around the atom. So it's not that something's orbiting. If it did, it would lose energy and crash. It's that the probability is smeared out. It's not, a, it's not a full explanation, of course. It's a bit of a, a, a half-baked explanation. Uh, this is still one of the biggest problems in physics and philosophy. It's called the measurement problem, what's really happening in quantum mechanics. But that's, that's roughly how we think of it. So what's it got to do with the superconductor? Well, you could have had the same objection to the superconductor. I said you set a current flowing, and it just stays flowing forever in a loop. But I also said you take a charge, and you move it in a loop, and it should radiate energy. There's electromagnetic radiation. So why does the current keep flowing around the loop? Shouldn't it stop? And our way of understanding it is, in fact, exactly the same. We say that we can't... Once the electrons form into this Bose-Einstein condensate, they become more than the sum of the parts. They're no longer individual electrons. They are a condensate. And it's no longer the case that you can think of individual electrons moving around that ring. You have to instead say there's a probability to find an electron, and it's spread out around the ring in exactly the same way that the, the, the electron was spread out around the atom. So in that sense, it's true that um, superconductors work their magic by manifesting quantum mechanics on the everyday scales. To understand how resistance comes about in the quantum world, in, in a normal metal, say, um, it comes about through, let's say, defects, impurity atoms, and the surfaces of the wire and so on. Uh, and those cause the electron uh, in the current to scatter. Okay? The scattering of electrons is, is how resistance comes about on those small scales. And in a superconductor, when the supercurrent is flowing, uh, if a point of resistance, say some impurity atom, tries to scatter an electron, it finds that it's no longer trying to scatter a single electron. It's now trying to scatter the entire condensate, and that it can't do. So this is why they conduct perfectly. OK, so I'm going to wrap things up there. Um, so I've, I've told you about an unfamiliar state of matter there, the, the superconductor, and you've seen that it's inherently quite magical, because I think it's quite unfamiliar. But I'd like to return to that point I made earlier, about what I think is the most magical thing that, that matter does. And crystals do this nicely, but actually all solids do it. It's not just crystals. Remember, you know, I, I sensed at the time maybe you weren't totally convinced was that this was the most magical thing they'd done. Um, but I take my crystal, and I push this end, and the whole thing moves. And I thought it was magical. But here's the thing. We agree, I hope, that it's magical when superconductors work their magic. They manifest quantum mechanics on familiar scales, right? It should be this crazy thing that only happens on small scales. They do it on a big scale. But here's the thing, this trick of pushing one atom here and all the atoms resisting is quantum in exactly the same way. It's, it's, it's not even an analogy, it's, it's mathematically the same. The fancy name for what a superconductor is doing when we say it's manifesting quantum mechanics in the everyday scales, we call this a coherent state, that's the fancy name for it in quantum mechanics. And you can describe the rigidity of a crystal or any solid as a coherent state in the same way, so it's a mathematically precise analogy. So, in this sense, I think, this is magical in the same way. You might say, okay, well, you might say, okay, this proves then that superconductors aren't really that magical after all. But I'd like to try and convince you, and I hope I have convinced you tonight, of the opposite, that you were right to think superconductors were magical when they did their magic. But then you must also admit 
that all matter is magical in exactly the same way, because it's performing the same trick. It's just doing it in a familiar way, and one that's practical. And that, I think, is the magic of matter. So I think I'll end things there. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>